eternal star sharing his compassion everywhere eternal star spreading good seeds throughout the world eternal star light the light for us all his compassionate heart a star lighting up the night his compassionate heart like a cloud floating freely his compassionate heart Shining Buddha's light on the world Vows to save all Mind of love Body like a cloud Free and unbound You his deed happiness and peace shine above compassionate heart a star Passionate heart, like a cloud floating freely. His compassionate heart, shining Buddha's light on the world. Vows to save all. Sharing his compassion everywhere On the Dharma path Spreading good seeds throughout the world What was his deed? Happiness and peace shine above For all of our participants joining in right now, welcome to our cloud lecture series. We'll start our lecture very shortly, so I just have a few reminders here for everyone. One, make sure your microphone is off and please turn on your camera. Um, our staff have also sent a virtual background in the Zoom chat 
So if you could change it into the virtual background we have provided, that would be really appreciated. Um, and a little quick preview of today's session. We, have, we are very honored to invite Dr. Lancaster from UC Berkeley and University of the West today to talk about encountering the extraordinary meeting Master Xing Yun. We do have a Q&A session with Dr. Lancaster at the very end of today's lecture, so be ready to ask lots of good questions. If you have any questions you would like to ask him, please write them into the Zoom chat or the YouTube chat box. Thank you very much, and we will short. We will start very shortly. Passing it hard, like a cloud floating freely. His compassionate heart shining through the light on the world Thoughts to save all Mind of love Body like a cloud Free and unbound You Everywhere, it's 
eternal star Spreading good seeds throughout the world Eternal star, light the light for us all His compassionate heart A star lighting up the night Compassionate heart Like a cloud floating freely His compassionate heart Shining Buddha's light on the world Vows to save all Mind of love Shine above Compassionate heart A star lighting up the night His compassion Floating freely His compassionate heart Shining Buddha's light on the world Vows to save all Mind of love Body like a cloud Auspicious greetings, everyone. I am Erin from Vancouver, and I right now just have a quick announcement, a quick reminder before we start. Um, if you're able to, please make sure that your cam my, your microphone is off and please turn on your camera so we can see everyone's beautiful faces. We have also sent a virtual background photo into our Zoom chat. So if you could, please change it to please change into our Zoom background so that everyone looks very, very consistent. Welcome to our BLIA North America Cloud Lecture Series. Today, we are very honored to invite Dr. Lewis Lancaster, Emeritus Professor at UC Berkeley and University of the West for an online lecture on Encountering the Extraordinary, Meeting Master Renro Xingyun. 
Dr. Lancaster has dedicated his life to the research and teaching of Buddhism. His teaching and research have impacted countless individuals around the globe. With over 75 research articles and reviews published, Dr. Lancaster certainly is not only an expert, but also his contributions are very, very instrumental in building the field of Buddhist studies. He assisted Venerable Master Shiming in the establishment of the University of the West and served as the president of U-West, leading the university through its initial phases of accreditation. In addition, Dr. Lancaster personally is also a very close friend of Ma Ma Venerable Master Xing Yun, with their friendship spanning over 35 years. So it's incredible and it's very, very amazing that Dr. Lancaster could be with us today to provide some insights into Venerable Master Xing Yun's life. I would also like to take the time to remind everyone that we will have a Q&A session with Dr. Lancaster at the end of today's lecture. So if you have any questions, please write them down in the Zoom or YouTube chat box. Now, let's coordinately welcome Dr. Lancaster. Please join your palms. Thank you very much. Hello, Dr. Lancaster. Hello, everybody, hello. Hello. Now you may take it away. Okay, thank you. Well, my thanks to all of you and particularly to Abbot Huidong and the BLIA leadership for giving me this invitation to share some memories of my experiences with Master Xing Yun. He and I shared a, a love of storytelling. That is, we use stories to help audiences grasp the import of complex teachings. So today, uh, I'd like to share three stories about the master with you. One uh, describes my first meeting. Uh, the second, a challenging request <laughs> that I made to him. And the third, a final event near the end of his life. My, my earliest encounter with Master took place in 1988. Shilai Temple was newly constructed, and it was used for the annual World Buddhist Fellowship Conference. This, this was a special and historic event because it was the only time that the fellowship had convened in the US. I sent in my proposal for a presentation on one of the panels. It was, it was something of a gamble because I outlined a paper and demonstration on the use of computers in Buddhist studies. From the perspective of today, that would not appear to be a big source of concern. However, in 1988, there was very little use in the humanities for the computer beyond being a new style convenient typewriter. Now, in the two years leading up to the conference, my idea of using computers in a more sophisticated manner had entered my life, but with little success. At the urging of professors Robert Thurman and Jamie Hubbard, I joined in a proposal to the National Endowment for the Humanities requesting funding to make a digital version of the Pali Canon. The reviewer of our application had been severe in rejecting what we had submitted. As difficult as it was to read those comments, I could only agree and accept that it was a valid appraisal of a flawed plan that would probably have failed to live up to our hopes. 
Nevertheless, I came out of that misadventure still convinced that the computer would in the future be a major tool for Buddhist research. Now, Jamie Hubbard and I continued to explore and try to imagine what the future might be. By the time of the 1988 conference, we were ready to share our findings. I, I was by no means certain that the program committee would accept us for one of the panels. It was a surprise when we were asked to give our demo to the entire delegation. Master Xing Yun had been consulted about this unusual proposal, and he gave it his full endorsement. And so Jamie and I found ourselves on the stage in the main auditorium. It was before there were ways to project the computer screen onto a larger one for viewers. We only had a desktop computer with a 16-inch screen, and we placed that on a table and showed mock-ups of how we believe text in the future would be input, searched, and recorded. I doubt that anyone in the audience could clearly see the small screen at such a distance. Indeed, there'd been several moments of laughter as we struggled to show the promise of the digital age. In many ways, it was too early to have attempted such a display. Well, when we finished, there was a call for questions. And the room remained silent. Then a voice was raised, expressing support and encouragement for what we were attempting. That voice was Master Xing Yun. He had from his earliest days of his teaching in Taiwan, been a proponent of using the technology of the age for conveying Buddhist material. One of my favorite pictures shows the master using a loudspeaker to attract attention and moving it about in a wheelbarrow. Well, later he would set up radio transmission, establish a video unit, and a television cable outlet. His use of developing technology far outpaced any prediction that we put forward that afternoon at Shilai Temple. My, my second story took place more recently. When the master in his waning years was once again consulted about one of my projects that needed support. With the help of Sarah Kinderdine and Jeffrey Shaw, I had begun to explore ways of studying the spread of Buddhism by sea. Now, Buddhist literature on the history of the spread of the tradition is still mainly directed toward the so-called Silk Road caravan routes that led across inner Asia from India to China. Only a handful of scholars paid any attention to the maritime route. I was guilty of the same limited view of Buddhist history. And for decades, my classes at Berkeley were never introduced to the importance of the ocean travel as compared to land-based caravans. Well, Professor Kinderdine and I put forward our initial proposal to a foundation in Hong Kong, a proposal asking for funds so that our research could be made available in a 3D virtual reality exhibit it was rejected. <laughs> the following year, when Professor Kinderdine, 
1869 had moved to the University of New South Wales in Australia, she rose once again to the occasion and put in an application to the Australia Research Foundation for money to gather visual and textual data for the construction of a virtual atlas of maritime Buddhism. Well, to our surprise and delight, the grant was given and camera crews directed by Professor Kinderdine set out to collect the digital data covering Buddhist coastal sites in India, Myanmar, Thailand, Cambodia, Sri Lanka, and Indonesia. The filming was done using 3D and surround methods. So once we had thousands of photos, videos, and sound recordings, the next step of making them available to the general public, as well as scholars, turned out to be nearly insurmountable. The cost of setting up projectors and VR environments meant that an exhibition of our digital material would cost more than a million dollars, and that just for installation. After installation, the exhibit would not be like most museum events with physical artifacts resting quietly in glass cases. It would require daily staff support to keep the complex array functioning. Well, no museum in the world was ready to take on such a risky exhibit until Master Xingyun gave his approval for Venerable Ru Chang, the director of the Buddha Museum in Kaohsiung, to initiate it. It was a risky thing for the museum to have an exhibit that was mainly digital. Nevertheless, with Master and Viral Ru Chan giving their full support to the project, it was possible for Professor Jeffrey Shaw to design a unique exhibition. So even faced with COVID restrictions, it has been installed. And after a little over one year, more than 800,000 visitors have experienced the wonder of virtual reality for the Buddhist Maritime Silk Road exhibit. Well, I don't wanna make this just a description of all the things I've done. The stories are told to share with you how much my professional life has been closely tied to the master and his willingness to consider innovation, technology, and less than perfect startups. In these stories, I think you can see how open-minded he was. I'm afraid I have a confession to make. My private thoughts about the master were not always as supportive of him as he was of me. I wondered, for example, whether Shilai Temple, built in the eastern suburbs of Los Angeles, would ever be able to attract supporters. I still had the idea of Chinatown near the downtown center of the city. But Master's vision proved that he had done exactly the right move as the suburbs of that area gained more and more Asian population. I also found it difficult to comprehend the scope of his outreach around the world. It seemed to me beyond belief that there were sufficient financial and human resources 
or temples in South Africa, Brazil, Paris, Chile, London, Shanghai, soon numbering over 200. How, how could such rapid and widespread growth be sustained? Well, as subsequent events have shown, under his guidance, even this most expansive project could be established. And what is more important, could be maintained. One day when I was working on a translation of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra, I came upon the debate between <clears throat> Shariputra and Sabuti. Sabuti is the one who had the most to learn. He puts forth the belief that the realization of full perfect enlightenment is a difficult thing to achieve. Whereas Subhuti, the one who's superior in understanding, replies that this realization for a bodhisattva is easy to attain. The reason is that when a bodhisattva lives with the thought of endlessness, then there is all the space and time needed to attain even the highest goals. So it struck me that while I, like Chariputra, believe that the accomplishments of the master were difficult, from the perspective of the master living with endlessness, all of his accomplishments were easy. The sutra statement, everything that may be realized is empty space, I think is the key to dealing with these issues. Having fully realized the reality of this, Master was not blocked from his vision of the spread of the teaching. He was not blocked by having some limitation in his thinking. His life had space for millions of followers. He had space for huge monasteries. He had space for hundreds of centers. He even had space for virtual reality. I now see that if we can live in such a spacious way, the magnitude of a task <clears throat> is not a great problem. In this sense, the master's actions were easy. Now, I mentioned that the master was a great storyteller. He had a large repertoire of stories that he drew upon in his sites. I think it's important to note that every famous storyteller had the ability to take a well-known tale and make it applicable to a new situation. One of my favorites among the stories that Master used over the years is that of Fayan Wenyi. This monk belonged to the mind-only school of thought. While he was a diligent student, he had never been able to fully grasp the teachings. Finally, the frustration of his practice became too much for him, and he decided to leave the monastery and seek for answers in a new environment. The abbot, Lohan Guichen, and Wenji approached him and indicated that he would be leaving the monastery to search for his enlightenment elsewhere. The abbot 
gave us encouragement and even walked with him when he made his departure. Now at the gate of the monastery was a large boulder. As they stood in front of the large stone, the abbot asked Wenyi if he thought the boulder was exterior or was it like every experience, inner consciousness only. That is, he was being asked if the experience of the boulder <clears throat> was inside or outside of the mind. When he immediately said, of course, the experience of the boulder is inside the mind. Well, the abbot thought for a moment and finally questioned, it is such a heavy rock. Why, why do you carry it along inside your mind when you travel here and there? Don't you feel it's too heavy to be burdened by it? Well, when he heard this and was speechless, as he finally saw the reality of consciousness only, so he returned to the monastery. He stayed there to study and practice his faith. Now, Master Xingyun used this story many times when teaching about the role of the external aspects of our lives compared to the internal ones. I think about this story often because I keep finding myself carrying the heavy weight of worry, fretting over what I'm faced with every day, getting up in the morning and when I have a new day in front of me is all too often made difficult as I pick up all the old boulders from the past and burden myself with discontent, anger, fear, and projecting these negative views into a vision of the future. I tell you, it's a constant effort to get rid of the boulders in my thoughts. One more story of the master that I remember and try to use in my life. This, this narrative tells of a monk, Tindai, who had a collection of rare orchids that he tended with great care. But one day he had to go on a trip and he turned to one of his disciples and asked him to water the orchids while he was away. Well, all went well until one day the disciple tripped and fell into the bed of orchids. Most of the blossoms were crushed and had to be removed. Well, you can imagine he was very upset and wondered what punishment he would receive for his failure to preserve the rare flowers. A few days later, Jindai returned and the dread moment came when the disciple had to confess that all was not well with the flowers, he bowed down before his teacher and admitted his role in the destruction of the orchids. Then he waited for the response. Instead of screaming in anger, his mentor put out a hand to comfort and said to him, I plant orchids for their beauty, for their use on the altar to honor the Buddha. I don't plant them in order to have anger. Well, in my old, old age, I don't always have control of my limbs. And I far too often for comfort drop cups and glasses that shatter when they hit the tile floor of the kitchen. 
like the disciple, I hate to have to tell my sister that I have just broken one of her favorites. She, she never shouts at me. She just says, the broken cup was made to be used. They were not made in order to punish someone who drops and breaks it. I need to be constantly reminded myself of the real reason for whatever I do. Our actions are not governed by only doing those things that don't succeed, those things that are fraught with potential problems, those things that are brain embarrassment. When we act to do the best we can in life, we need to keep in mind that if problems arise that cause, they may arise that cause disappointments and misunderstandings. But there's, this, this is one of the reasons I so enjoy having an orchid plant nearby. I need to be reminded every day that I don't have the orchid in order to have anger and resentment. Remembering the master is, is like my orchid. I don't remember him to have regrets and despair. Now, my last moment with him was after he'd lost his sight and was unable to easily speak. He was in his wheelchair chair outside the main shrine at Foganshan. And I sat down in the chair beside him. They told him that I was there. He reached out, took my hand, just held it, without putting any pressure on it. Even in his condition, he was still giving me a moment of loving kindness at our parting. It was an extraordinary encounter. It was extraordinary. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lancaster. Thank you for presenting an insightful discussion on Venerable Master Shiming's aspirations and accomplishments. We're now very blessed with a fresh, fresh perspective of Master Shiming's life and deeds and a deeper understanding of his spirit and legacy. Before we continue to the next section, I would like to take the time to acknowledge a special guest that are joining us here on Zoom with us. Um, Dr. Ming Ho Tai, President of the University of the West. So, President Ta, I'm not sure if you would like to come up and share a few words with our audiences here. Hello. Hello. <laughs> thank you very, very much, Dr. Lancaster, and thank you, uh, Aaron, for um, giving me the form to uh, share a few words. Um, I always um, to be honest, before I arrive at US, um, I have very little knowledge um, of Master, um, Venerable Master Xinyin, and particularly um, Dr. Louise Lancaster. I think I heard of your name from UC Berkeley at Cal, but never have a chance uh, to really uh, learn from you um, or get to know you. However, in this short three years at U.S., I have to say that you constantly inspire me. And the more I learn about um, Venerable Master Xinying, the more I come to a realization that this is really an extraordinary man, um, an extraordinary leaders, a full his heart is full of compassion, kindness, and is so contagious that his love and kindness 
um, have always been so contagious. So many people that he influenced and he really have the eyes of talent. He has been able to gather many talented individuals to help him carry out his mission. He is such a visionary um, who won't give up and he know um, what he want um, his, his vision to carry out. And you, Dr. Louis Lancaster is one of those example. Um, your professional friendship with him for and your friendship with him, uh, you too is almost like what we would call soulmate. Um, you don't have to say much to each other, just from learning from the story that you share today, but just from the nonverbal language and from a very little um, thing that you have to say, um, the venerable Master Xing Yin, oh, we know that you're the right person who could help him and who would um, be his partner in terms of uh, carry out um, the teaching, the preaching of Dharma and expand it um, to so many continents. Um, so I just have to say that I feel very blessed um, to be here at University of the West learn much, uh, continue to learn about um, the Venerable Master Singing, um, continue to be inspired by the people um, that in his team and continue uh, to learn from you, uh, Dr. Lancaster. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, President Pa. Mm -hmm. Um, so now we will move on to our Q&A session and open the floor to questions from our audiences here. So, uh, Dr. Lancaster, our first question for you is that um, I understand that you are a close friend of Venerable Master Xingming, and it seems like you have witnessed much of his great work, too. So from your perspective, how was that like? How's that process? And how would you describe this 30 year long friendship of yours with Federal Master Xing Ming? Well, uh, thank you, Aaron. I, I tried to uh, express it in, in the title I gave to my lecture, Encounter with the Extraordinary. He was an extraordinary person. And all of us who've had a chance to come into contact with him or with what he created, like we all feel that, that he was so extraordinary that it was, as I indicated, it was, it was hard for me to fully and finally accept the fact of just how extraordinary he was. And I did treasure all that he did for me, but I treasured more that I felt um, that we, we were friends. And I think our age, the fact that we were closer in age than to most of the people around us um, was felt by us. I'm now in my 90th year. He, of course, lived far into his 90s. But as I pointed out in my talk, my last meeting with him, um, even though he was in such dire physical condition, He gave me a, a, a loving kindness gesture. So I think all of us should understand that extraordinary people don't come along that often. And when they do, 
And if you come in contact with them, as some of us have with Master, make the best of it that you can. Don't forget what they tried to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lancaster. Um, well, we well, we can now move on to our second question. So from your perspective and drawing from your expertise, what would you say would be the difference between humanistic Buddhism and the original Buddhism? Well, I... I, I never like to feel that there are, there are of course different, many differences between every Buddhist group, every Buddhist scripture. There are differences from one year to the next, but it's not the differences that have formed the core of the teaching. That that core, that issue of dealing with the, the human condition and being able to help and to have compassion for ourselves and to have compassion for others, I think has been there from the beginning in Buddhism. That's why I've always felt that one of the great strengths of Buddhism was that the Buddha was a human. He came into this world and lived a human life. And he passed from this world as a human. And his final experience of enlightenment took place as a human. And that I think has been the issue which I feel that Master Xing Yun was trying to say with humanistic Buddhism. It, it's a tradition that is works for us as humans. And it's not that it needs to wait for the next birth or that it's passed away in the last birth. It's, it's something which belongs to us as we sit here in our human condition. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is actually really related to what you just mentioned. And um, that is, what do you think is the most valuable or the most precious component of this humanistic Buddhism that Venerable Master Shaming has established? Oh, I think it's compassion. Would you like to elaborate a little? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think that for the Buddhist tradition, if you wonder, and what is what I'm doing correct? Am I getting this Buddhist tradition right? Am I reading this text in a correct fashion? Have I just acted in a Buddhist way? Any of those questions that we ask ourselves, the answer from the Buddhist perspective is, if whatever we are doing brings us to a sense of compassion, then we're probably doing all right. If we have anger, if we have 
despair, if we have resentments, envy, then probably we're not doing it quite right. We need to go back and, and look again and try to find our compassion. I, I often tell the story of, in my, my experience, and some of you have heard these, these stories, but as I told you, a good storyteller repeats the story because they adapt it <laughs> to whatever the situation is. I had a colleague uh, who was a really famous professor at one of the top universities in the country. And I had a lot of trouble with him because he was arrogant and he was uh, so full of himself. And he talked about himself all the time and praised himself. And I just tried to stay away from him. It was like, oh no, there he is again. But then one day at a conference, he came up to me And he said, my father died today. And I was taken aback. And I, I said, you know, I, I said, I'm so sorry. And he said, my father never liked me. When I was young, my father, who was famous in another field, had me tested to see if I was really good in math. And the test came back that no, I was not. <laughs> and he never felt that I was worth anything after that moment. And even when he was given a position as a full professor at a major university, his father said to him, uh, they've made a mistake. Can you believe it? When I heard him talk about that, I suddenly loved him. I just thought, how much you have achieved faced with this difficult background. So talk about yourself, praise yourself. <laughs> I don't mind anymore. <clears throat> that, that's what I mean, I think, by compassion. That when we really understand a situation and we have wisdom, Compassion is, is there. I think it just comes to us. Understood. So it seems like compassion and wisdom could be really great um, guiding principles when we are on the path of practicing humanistic Buddhism. So our next question from our audience is, as lay followers, what advice could you give us going forward now that Master, Venerable Master Shiming is no longer with us? Yes, I, I'm, I'm really happy to address this. Thank you for that question. I, I truly, truly hope that the people who are part of BLIA understand that what Master Xing Yun did in this world and what he stood for is still needed. That it's, it needs continued, our continued effort. And that's what Master Xing Yun did for all of us. He gave us tasks to do. He gave us challenges. And we shouldn't forget those. 
in my estimation. Some people feel that they want to wait and be reborn in the next life with him. And I have no, <laughs> no, no, no problem with that, but I want us all to remember that we were born in this life with him. We, we have had it in that sense. And I don't think we should lightly throw that away or just give it up on the sense that I can't really try to live out this vision unless Master Shingen is alive. He, he didn't live his life for us to feel that way. He definitely, I mean, when I look at, at the way in which he set up the Hoganshan so that it could continue to do what he was trying to do from the moment of his death onward. He never ever thought that he wanted to set up something which would come to an end at his death. Never. He never would have thought that. He never did it. He spent years at the end of his life trying to set it up so that it would continue and that his dream and his visions and everything that he tried to do would keep on happening. And that's what he gave to all of us. He left us with this mission. I, I was once told that when somebody that you love dies, they always leave you with a gift. And you need to find it. You need to find what was the gift that Master Xing Yun left us. What is that gift? So I, I don't worry about, <clears throat> in one way, I don't worry about the fact that as much as I miss him, and but from another perspective, um, that's, that's not what he taught us. He didn't come into the world to be missed. He came into the world to have compassion, to serve, and to help humans deal with the problems that they are faced as humans in this world, in this flesh and blood. So my feeling is we need to keep doing that. Thank you. Thank you. I definitely agree. And I think that really provides some insight into how everyone could um, to adapt and to deal with this loss. Our next question here for you, Dr. Lancaster, is that continuing the altruistic legacy of Venerable Master Xing Yun, what are the current social maladies, maladies in the United States that humanistic Buddhism can work to address? Well, it seems to me that what we what we are facing in our country, maybe more so than you were facing in Canada, those of you that are in Canada, but what we're facing is somehow the idea that the way to respond to a situation is with hatred and with gunshots. And we need to remind everybody that we have to respond with compassion. 
I have to admit that there are times when I disagree with other people in my country so much that I grow angry at them. And I want to push them out of my heart. And that includes family members even. And, and I realize, you know, the three poisons are greed, hate, and delusion. And, and when I do that, I, I'm operating from the point of view of, of a poison. And the antidote to poisons is generosity, compassion, and ability to have a spiritual life. And we can do that, even in the face of these horrendous problems. I think that's as much as I can say. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Dr. Lancaster. Um, our next question is concerning about the digitalization of humanistic Buddhism. So the question is, Venerable Master Shiming and yourself has always been ahead of time, ahead of your time. In response to the advent of AI, how can we use platforms like ChatGPT to help with the study and propagation of Buddhism? Uh, this is this is one place where I really uh, I really <laughs> wish that I could have Master Xing Yun to talk to. If there's anybody on Earth who would have looked at artificial intelligence AI and said, let's take this thing and let's use it for Buddhism. He would have been the one. So I'm trying to do that. So next fall, I'm going to teach a course on artificial intelligence and Buddhist studies at University of the West. Thanks to President Ta being so accommodating to let me try this brand new course, a new kind of course. And I want to make it open to anybody. I don't want it to be a just for uh, even not even just for students. I'd, I'd like to make it open to any of you because we're all going to have to deal with this. It's, it's our future, like it or not. We're going to live with artificial intelligence for the rest of our lives. And fortunately for some of you, your life is all going to be a lot longer than mine, and you're going to have changes that will be beyond anything that I could possibly describe to you today. But it's a tool. And Master never threw away one of these technological tools. He didn't throw away television. He didn't throw away radio. He didn't throw away movie making. He didn't throw away music. He didn't throw away any tool which could be used to communicate with people. And artificial intelligence is going to be the way people will communicate with one another in the future, and we already do it. Look at us here. Here we are. Thousands of miles apart, some of us. With our image on this page in our computer. Listening to our words, speaking to each other. Can you imagine what people would have thought about this in 1950? Even that of that short a time in the past. And yet we need to make sure that what we do with artificial intelligence is for humans. 
the danger of it is as great as its potential. The danger is that resources will accumulate to fewer and fewer people. The dangers are that people will use it to manipulate, to influence. And we need to be alert. We can't just say, oh, it's wonderful, I accept it. That's not how it works. It's a challenge. And I think Master Xing Yun knew that about technology. You don't just accept it as it is. You have to transform it and make it something which works for what you want and the values which you hold. So I, I, I challenge <laughs> President Ta, universities in the future are gonna have to deal with this. And I know she knows that, but we need to understand that BLIA needs to understand that this is coming at you. It's coming at your children. And you, you mustn't just feel that it's insignificant. It is an important thing and we need to be alert. We need to keep our focus and we need to try to make it so that it enriches life rather than detracts from it. My little sermon, sorry. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you very much. And as a college student, I personally feel like the topic of AI and digitalization is very, very timely and something that is very, very significant for us to think about for the future. Um, our next question from audience here on Zoom is that we know that Venerable Master Xing Wing was very fond of technology and modernization long before we all encounter modern technology. For example, I know that Master Xing Wing loved his distance learning classes at University of the West, which was almost 20 years ago before the COVID pandemic hit when we all learned how to use Zoom. Can you please elaborate more about your experience with Venerable Master Xing Wing during the distance learning classes at U West almost 20 years ago? Yes. As usual, it, it was before we really should have done it. But I asked him to come over to U.S. and give us a series of lectures. And I asked him, can we put you online, live? Now, this, this is way back then. We really didn't have the bandwidth. <laughs> we, it was kind of, it was difficult. But the first night that we did this, it was so exciting. Master Xing Yun was sitting in the auditorium at U West, and he was speaking to maybe 200 people. And online, we had connections to temples all across the country. And we had 800 people online with him that night. And they were able to ask him questions. And he was, he was really, uh, it was just his kind of environment. He loved it. And I've never forgotten some of the answers he gave to people. <laughs> they, were, they were typical of Master Xing Yun. I remember one person said, I need an amulet to give me good luck and good fortune. And if you'll just tell me a mantra or tell me or sell me an amulet so I can have this, will you do that? And we all waited to see what Master Shayun would do with that question. <laughs> and he said, Well, it it seems to me 
that people who are lucky work hard. And that was his answer. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> he didn't try to deal with the issues of whether or not he would say, oh, we have, you know, here, here's this wonderful mantra, you use that and you'll be happy and you'll be fortunate and you will like it because I've given you this power. He wasn't like that. He came right back and said, people who are lucky work hard. And at that moment, I think I realized um, this man is extraordinary. <laughs> so, yeah, it was, oh, people kept, you know, we would lose contact because our bandwidth wasn't wide enough. <laughs> and uh, we had all kinds of problems, but we managed. And during those lectures, uh, I would say, to this day, probably, we've never had such an audience for something from U.S. as we had when Master Xing Yun sat in the auditorium and we put him online to centers all over North America, at least. But we also had South America on and we had Taiwan and people were staying up late at night or getting up at the crack of dawn to be there. It was very interesting and exciting time. Thank you. Thank you. It's incredible. It's incredible to see how sort of technology has come back to the full loop where we are returning back. We had a time where we were returning back to that online lecture during the pandemic. Yeah. Um, I know we have lots of incredible questions coming in from our audiences, but due to time constraint, we only have time for one last question. And this one is, Federal Master Ximing has always emphasized the importance of education. With our Fu Guangshan Contorium of Universities, each university has its unique offering. So what do you think are some of the areas of study that US can potentially develop as a small institution that has a humanistic, compassionate orientation. Yes, uh, it it is it is remarkable the support which Master Xing Yun gave to higher education. I can't think of of a Buddhist leader who has done more, set up more campuses. And yet at the same time, he understood that each campus had its own role to play. And each of them is quite different, in fact. But education in the future is, is at danger. More and more students are deciding not to go to college. Junior colleges have 30% fewer applicants in the United States than they did before the pandemic. We are struggling to understand how to recover or what role to play in the post-pandemic world to help people. U.S. has done some wonderful things like their chaplaincy program to prepare people to go into prisons and hospice centers and hospitals and the army and as chaplains. And that, that's a wonderful and, and dedicated. And I still believe that uh, the monastic communities, many of them monastics are 
in need of being able to have a place to go to study. Because particularly with immigrants who come into the United States, they're left all alone, many of these monks who come and nuns. They're, they have separated themselves in some degree by, by moving from one country to another. And I think that we need to help them because they still need to learn, everybody does. And that everything is changing so fast. When I look at Buddhism in Taiwan, I would say that it made such an impact globally through Master Xing Yun and through the other groups in Taiwan, remarkably so. And it was because after the recovery and, and development in Taiwan, you had educated lay people. And suddenly monks and nuns had to be also educated as it is today. How many people in a, in a Buddhist group have college training? I'm sure that it's higher than perhaps almost any other religion. So our, our monastics are being tested all the time because they are having to serve a, a, an educated lay group. And that's going even more so because each generation is now putting more and more effort into educating their children. And how are we going to deal with these very sharp young people who are deeply trained in technology and business and all of those issues? So education is by no means assured in terms of survival of colleges and universities. Not every college and not every university is gonna survive all this, and many are not. So I hope that the Buddhist will recognize that if we can make our colleges and universities that are Buddhist informed and keep them alive and growing and developing make them a way to try to respond to the changes that are coming. We need to think about these changes and we need to have people who are, who are being prepared to deal with the world as it's going to come. So that's why I really appreciate the President Taz allowing me to teach a class on artificial intelligence. I'm not any good at it. I'm going to have to bring in a lot of, like, of other speakers because it's not my field. It's not something that I myself can personally tell you exactly how to do it or whatever. But I feel that I, that Master Xing Yun is kind of looking over my shoulder and saying, yeah, go ahead, take a chance, do this. <laughs> There's space enough to have artificial intelligence, just like there was space enough for large monasteries for thousands of members. There's space. And I always remember his words, there's enough to do what you want to do. There's always enough to do it. It's not that we lack having enough to do it. It's knowing how to take enough and make it efficient and workable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lancaster, for giving such great insights to, di to the digitalization and globalization of Buddhism. And thank you, everyone, for participating and giving us so incredible and such amazing questions.
Uh, I would also like to share a comment that we have in the Zoom chat here. Um, it says, auspicious ble blessings, Dr. Lancaster. Thank you so much for sharing your memories of Venerable Master Shi Yun. I share the di difficult feelings in revising all those memories. I've, as you've reminded, we will remember by heart what Venerable Master Shi Yun has taught and, and left for us. I promise that I will continue his path as far as I can. Thank you, doc, thank you, Dr. Lancaster. So that was a comment from Zoom chat that I wanted to share. Thank you. That that's very moving. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. And that brings us to the end of our lecture today. Our next cloud lecture will be on May 28th, and it will be in Chinese. And our next English one will be October 29th. So definitely keep an eye out for that. Once again, thank you very much, Dr. Lancaster, for joining us today and offering your profound insights into the life, aspirations, and deeds of Venerable Master Xin Wing. And thank you, everyone, for joining and coming today. May we all cultivate a heart that blooms in all seasons. And good night, everyone. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank, so Bye -bye. Bye. thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Thank you. Eternal star, sharing his compassion everywhere. Eternal star, spreading good seeds throughout the world. Eternal star, light the light for us all. His compassionate heart, a star lighting up the night. His compassionate heart, like a cloud floating free. His compassionate heart shining Buddha's light on the world. Vows to save all, mind of love, body like a cloud, free and unbound. Shine above the passionate heart, a star lighting up the night, his compassion. Cloud floating freely. His compassionate heart shining Buddha's light on the world. Vows to save all. Mind of love. Body like a cloud. Peace and that.
Happiness and peace shine above